We're good to go? All right, guys. Hi, everybody. Hi. Uh, so my name is Shadi Safadi. Um, I'm founder of One Pixel Brush, which is a concept studio. We just do concept art, high-end concept art. I think some of the best concept artists that we have. And uh, these, these guys on our team are from all over the world. They all work remotely, and they all do just amazing, outstanding work. And this has been an experiment the last couple years. I left Naughty Dog, one of the greatest game studios that exists, to start my own company and kind of learn the ropes of managing people. And since I'm a concept artist, too, and I, I'm kind of on both ends, I'm, on the, I'm in the middle now. I, I train people, but I also have art directors above me. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what it's like being an art director kind of when you know both jobs and you're getting used to one, but you already know the other. So, you know, some of what I'm going to talk about is just like the personal hearts and minds stuff of being an artist, because that's not really talked about too much. It's a big, it's a big factor, I think. Um, quickly, though, before I start, who here, raise your hand if you are an art director. OK. Raise your hand if you're an artist. 3D, OK. Raise your hand if you're a concept artist or aspiring concept artist. Cool. All right, cool. You can aspire. I'm, I'm only asking because I'm going to come at everything from a concept perspective. And I'm also going to come at everything from a sort of brass tacks perspective. Because I don't, everything I do was dependent on this company even running. If any of this stuff didn't work, I wouldn't have a company. You know what I mean? And our, some of our clients are the biggest game studios in the world. And it surprises me that Infinity Ward calls and is like, hey, can you guys do all our concepts for our new, new, IP, you know, new IP? I'm like, well, damn, we must be pretty good because the Infinity Ward called us. Like, but uh, you know, we're always struggling to get better every day. And um, I'm going to kind of do more of a free form thing. I'm not going to go through slides one at a time. I'm just going to kind of have conversation and pull up images to discuss. And I'll stop probably like 10, 15 minutes before the end so you guys can ask questions and we can get into some stuff. Um, OK. Here's the first thing I want to talk about. And I've talked about this on a Gumroad tutorial uh, series. And this is what I like to call, let's see here. I'm going to use Photoshop, too. Uh, this is what I like to call the law of increasing awesomeness. OK? And this has been a really important thing, I think, in watching talent grow. Because this, if this wasn't possible, again, this company would not be possible. Because I couldn't take people who were young and who had a lot of like, skill that you can kind of see and make them pro concept artists if there weren't roads. And basically what it says is you can kind of wander up this road, right? I, this was a dig at Art Institute. Sorry, guys. Uh, <laughs> I went to Art Center, so we got to bang them. Uh, so you could, you, no matter where you're starting, you're kind of moving up this mountain, right, in your artistic growth, in your career. And there are so many roads to go up. You know, there's so many ways to get up here to what we would call, you know, art god. Now, an art god isn't, I have some personal art gods, I'm sure you guys do too, and, and they're not necessarily better, uh, best artists in the world, but they are to you. You know, you don't know anyone better, let's say. So whoever those people that, you can't even imagine someone better. And, and later I'll talk about finding the right art gods too, because again, this art god could be here, the kind of art god that works on Avatar, and the kind of art god that works on World of Warcraft is a completely different one. Do you know what I mean? So everything I'm telling you is biased and determined by my personal taste. And that's something that we don't really talk about too much, right? Because we say these are some truisms of art. And we all kind of say the same truisms, but mine are all gearing towards what my own personal taste is. And I get to, right? And you get to. Everyone gets to. That's your career path should follow your taste. Um, and uh, oh, I'm sweetly tethering Wi-Fi off my phone. I'm so excited. OK, so I have some internet. Um, so this is the style of stuff that I push my guys to do, because I like it. It's grounded, it's realistic, um, and it's grounded, and it's realistic. <laughs> and it's grounded, and it's realistic. I like grounded and realistic. So oblivion, not Pacific Rim. You know what I'm saying? Although I enjoyed Pacific Rim more than I enjoyed Oblivion. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I thought it was a more fun movie. I, I liked it better. But uh, that super classy, like, Oblivion, you're like, how is everything so slick? I can't even believe it. That's what I personally like. So that's what I tell every one of my guys to do. And that's what I hire people who, have the, who I feel like have that aesthetic. So you should know everything I'm saying is filtered through, do you want your work to look like this? 
And if you don't, you want it to look like something else, then maybe some of this applies, but not all of it. You know what I'm saying? Because everything I'm going to say, I'm going to say dogmatically as if that's the truth. It is the truth for this, but it's not the truth for every style. Um, it's the truth for what I like. Um, so that's just a rough idea of kind of like what we, how we put stuff together. Now, back to this thing. The reason this is important is because I have seen people, I personally know people who have graduated school with a portfolio that just looks like a normal graduation from college art school portfolio. It's just, it's just dog shit, you know, it's okay. Um, and it's not, it's not that bad, it's not that bad, but you're talking about like, the people who do concept art professionally for the top companies in the world, it's only like, I don't know, 200 people, right? I mean, how many people are at that high level, the names that you know, how many concept artists can you name that are amazing? There's only like a handful. So all those guys didn't get there just through drawing mileage. You know, they didn't just do figure drawing. Some of them did, like Wes Burt, that guy. How many of you guys know Wes Burt? Amazing. I mean, okay, so there are those anomalies, those people that have been doing this every day. And if you want to be that guy, just go for it. Like, I'm going to cheer you on all the way. But what I'm going to try to tell you about is there's a shortcut. Because here's the road I went up. Well, not me, Mache. You guys know who Mache Kusiara is? I always bring him up every talk I have because uh, he's one of the best. Let's see if he pulls up on here. Oh, you know what? I, have, I made folders because I planned. Um, the best. <laughs> All right, here's, here's some of Mache's stuff. And you're like, shut up, dude. And then he did this. Too. What are you even talking about? Just shut your mouth. What? <laughs> Comic book style, and you can just also do awesome illustration, and it's like super beautiful and like beautifully painted and photos, but you can't quite tell where the photos were used, and some photo in the background and some overpainting. It's all about the subtleties with him. He like knows how to hide his tracks like a mofo. <laughs> I'm keeping it clean, even though you put a profanity in the description of this talk which offended me, even though I wrote it and sent it to you. Uh, this, you know, it's like he's really good at, in my opinion, he's one of the best. And he can do really grounded stuff, too. So when he started at Naughty Dog, we were all kind of like following him. And he was like up here. And we, would all, we were all like right here. We're like, oh, there's Mache. Let's go. Yeah, 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 yeah. But we had no will of our own. We had no mind of our own. Because I don't give a shit. He's up there, we're down here, let's go. Okay? And if you have that attitude, you get better so much faster. Because what I see a lot of artists doing is they graduate and they have a lot of, I, they have their own way of doing things, right? And they, they feel like art is an exploration, right? And art can be an exploration. You can just kind of go, uh, uh, and stop here and there's an avalanche and you fall down and then you start climbing again. If you don't know where you're going, you can just explore for your whole life, for your whole career, and no one will fault you for it. And if you're Wes Burt, for example, that guy's been drawing, he just went, yeah, and I'm getting up here. Screw you guys. He didn't need any shortcuts, and I admire that. That's if you have, have the time. But the, the, the thing I wanna just point out is that we're gonna die, all of us, really soon. <laughs> so you don't have forever, you have like a limited amount of time. And if you wanna be a superstar, then just might as well go up the way this other guy's going. The hard part about it is it's going to mean giving up some stuff that you might hold dear and things you might truly love about art. And I honestly have to say, some of the stuff that has changed in concept art is so hard to swallow that it makes art, it can make art not fun anymore. Because maybe you like drawing, you know? And not drawing just makes it so like, I don't want to build 3D or use models that I found, you know, that's gross to me. Yeah, it's tough sometimes. But we watch Maché and he would go up here and we'd be like, oh, there's Maché, cool. And now, since I started a company, I stopped. I'm not very good at art anymore because I haven't done it in like two years. All right? So I've made a camp right here, base camp. <laughs> and I tell people very clearly how to come up this way because I know that way. And then I tell them, uh, Mache went that way, go. And, I, and I, just, I can look at them from binoculars, but my team is going to get better than me. There's no way around it. They're going to get better than me. And in, a, in two more years, if I don't keep doing art, I'm going to eventually, they're going to be like, I'm gonna say some art direction stuff and my best guys are gonna be like, all right, dude, like, all right, whatever, you're in charge, I guess, but I have to listen to you, right? And that, you know, all of you know art directors like that because that's what happened. I can tell, I can see it happening to me. You can't be Kobe and Phil Jackson. It's impossible. You have to stop playing in order to coach. 
So this is what I decided to do because I enjoy it. Now our team is about 10 guys from all over the world and it's worked. I've seen it work. I've seen guys go from like terrible to amazing. So let me give you an example of someone, not one of my team, but a guy named John Sweeney. He works at Naughty Dog, all right? Uh, and he gave me this idea to have folders on our, on our computer that uh, are called Great Artistry, right, in our Dropbox. So in Great Artistry, we have the best work that any person has done, like a wall of fame. And then we have another folder called Great Shardistry. <laughs> you know what sharding is? Because that's what this work looks like. And it's all of our work that was the worst, just most abysmal stuff, okay? Now, I'm going to show you some of John's barely just graduated, and I called him right before to ask him permission to do this some of his just graduating work. And some of you might look at this and be like, that's not that bad, you're an asshole. Well, it, it is, so. <laughs> okay, so it was this kind of thing and uh, this kind of thing, which is like rendered, not photo reference, like hand painted. Like I said, there's a huge market for that. There's a lot of people that do that. There's a lot of games that do that. You saw what my taste is, right? So that's why I don't want this. But he wanted to work at Naughty Dog, okay? And he was doing stuff, you know, graduating school that looked like that or like this, you know? Like, it's, it's a height, it's a height, but it's kind of gross. It's like hard to look at because he's not using photo reference. He's not loving what's there in plumes of smoke. Like, if you were to Google, like, uh, you know, terrible tragedies are great for video game reference, but if you Google any wars and you go online, you'll find amazing photos of like war-torn areas with people running and what the smoke really looks like and the subtleties of the smoke and the layers and the little bits of smoke. That's what's beautiful. But that's like another level. In three months, I watched him go from, th from that to someone who, this was his art test. Probably three to four months. And the way he did it was he listened to everything that Eitan, another artist there, and me had told him. And he sent us work for constant feedback. And when we told him what to do, he didn't argue. He just did it. He's like, oh, really? That's the way you do it? OK, I'm starting over. Now, this took him a few weeks, actually, like so much time. Because there's a lot of people that take the Naughty Dog art test and fail it. Um, and then, you know, like more recently, he did this one. This is one of his more recent. He's gotten even better. He's one of his more recent paintings. And he really likes, his pers personal thing is that Rainbow Six sort of uh, just badass espionage style. That's kind of his thing. But he went on to get a job there because he changed up his whole style. He started using photo reference in different ways. He started, and this is probably partly from screen grabs. He just, he added so many things to his technique. Um, and he leveled up a million fold. Another thing is I wanted to show is, is examples off of our site. And it might be, for some of you, hard to see the difference. You might be like, well, I don't really see how that one is better than this one or whatnot. This is how, this is one of my concepts. This is not how I would concept nowadays. But this is all hand-painted, right? The plane is hand-painted. The, there's no photo reference used. I, I probably had photos to look at, right, to draw from. Uh, but I didn't actually have any photos in there. And the reason um, this doesn't work is because now, with a couple different things, the way you use photos and blend them, the way you use textures and blend them so that nothing looks too photo-y, but everything doesn't look hand-painted at the same time, it looks so much more slick and pro. Same with characters. This is one of our guys that did characters uh, that I couldn't use, right? Because he's doing a dude. Like, why are you pan-painting a dude? Instead, he started finding a picture of a posed dude and like working it into the design. Now, some of you might be like, well, some of the artistry goes away when you do that, when you find the photo, right? But what is concept art about? What's that? Idea, right? It's about good idea. But we're artists, so we like the art of it, too. But that doesn't mean the good idea, you might miss out on a few things in the painting department, but you get to express so much more. Like, you would have never drawn this, you know? You wouldn't have sketched this out. This had to be found. You couldn't have come up with it. And if you had an idea for a flashlight that had holograms that you could push, that's a cool idea. If you had to draw it out, you probably wouldn't. It'd take you a long time to realize it. This probably took four hours. Um, and the main reason is, where the profanity was in the description of this talk, it's about the freaking modelers and the 3D artists, because you're not doing it for you, you're doing it for someone else. So I'm surprised, honestly, how far concept art has come as a field uh, where we just get to loose brush shit and everyone's like, oh, cool. I'm like, oh, wow. 
Like, so many people give us so much credit for being so inspirational that they forget that they could have Google searched something almost as, like, better. So, you know, and piggybacking off of some stuff Rob said in his talk earlier, which was so true, that reality is not the be-all, end-all. You have to plus it. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk about, show you this thing. This is something I made for some future uh, Gumroad talks that we're doing. It's called The Four Zones of Awesomeness. Okay, and I'll put this online on our website. You can get a copy of it. Um, and what I tried to do was outline the categories as I saw it, based on training these guys from beginning to end, as I saw it, what are the zones of area that can be improved on, right? What are the zones of areas that can be worked on? And I broke it down. Now, this is not going to stay like this. This is going to constantly change as the industry changes. But I will talk about each one of these things briefly, and then I'll go into a little more detail on each one. So, cheatiness. Do you use photo reference and 3D to steal colors, get poses exactly right, or put outright photographs in your shot as an actual part of your painting, and then hide your tracks expertly so no one will ever know, like a boss? Good. Okay, and this is gonna refer to all the different ways in which you can cheat. And in this one, you're kind of cherry picking. And part of art directing my team, I've noticed, because I was telling them over lunch today, we had a disaster yet just last night. I was about to give an art direction talk. One of the art directors I work with was pissed off at some stuff we delivered. And I was like, God damn it. I can't give this talk anymore. But it was the reason was is because we approached uh, something with the wrong cheating technique, I think. And I told my guy what to do. And I helped coach him, but I coached him in the wrong direction. Um, but here's all the ways in you can cheat. Let's talk about them real quick as an overview, just so you know what's possible. One of them, the most egregious, is Google Earth. Um, did you guys know that you can fly around cities in Google Earth? And like if you're doing a city shot with Batman or something, you can like just find the shot in the city and you have most of the city kind of done? You know what I mean? Or you could just use it to find a nice composition or have a good 3D perspective of a city. If you were going to do like a Batman or something posed on a roof, and you wanted to just have something to get you going, granted you were going to replace all this, but you got windows for scale, even if you replace all these textures. Do you know what I mean? And imagine how useful that is. I mean, what a shame to have this and not even use it just to give you a rough idea. You have this 3D library of stuff that just exists in uh, real cities, 3D modeled for you with textures all over the world for you to fly around. Think about it. We use that sometimes. That's Google Earth. 3D DAZ, I don't have that pulled up. Do you guys know DAZ? Anyone know DAZ? Let me show you the power of DAZ real quick. So for one of our paintings, we had um, this. This is a recent one we did for Ultima Underworld. They just met their Kickstarter, so congrats to them. Um, legendary game designers, uh, and they commissioned us to do this piece. Now, this piece I'm going to talk about in and out. I'm going, to, I'm going to have like three or four pieces that I keep going back to and discussing, because each one has so many parts of what we do in the cheatiness department and the design department. Um, but yeah, this was the basic uh, final. And in some ways, I have to say, in some ways, that piece, probably the most elaborate we've ever done, was a financial disaster. And that's why it's such a good case study, because we're going to talk about all the things in it that worked and didn't work. We almost took every road and came back to final. And we made it what I thought was good, but it, was, uh, we, it, it hurt us. And we learned a lot from it. So it was mainly a learning experience. But Daz, ta-da. This is how artists block out complicated scenes with lots of characters at our studio. Um, just figure it out like this. Even put basic lights in there. So Modo, if you're into concept art uh, and you don't know Modo or you don't know 3D software, I would say that's the number one skill you need to have after Photoshop. I can't even imagine starting now and not having any 3D. It's like you can, almost can't. For us, again, based on my taste, you saw what I like. Based on my taste, you can't do any of that work without 3D knowledge. Uh, and especially because like this, he could move the camera anywhere he wants, so we could try out a bunch of different things. And these models, we didn't even make them. We just found them online. They're free. Daz has a library. You just get one. 
And if you need to buy one, you just buy one. They're like, whatever, 30 bucks. You could buy an armored dude for 30 bucks and use that as a start to design your character. And then you have a 3D guy that you can pose however you want and then start painting on top of him. Why are you drawing him from scratch? In four hours, you could change the design to whatever you want, but now you get to focus on the design. You don't have to worry about getting the drawing right. You get to focus on the design, and it's going to look so slick. I'll show you another example of some Daz-looking stuff. What we got here? Here's some other zombies we did. And it started with Daz, just kind of like figuring out the basic poses. And this was a top-down three-quarter game deadline. And uh, we ended up using these as a base and then painting on top of them. This guy went nuts with him. We'll talk about this guy a little bit more. But uh, having that 3D base let him spend so much time on other stuff. So much time, because you kind of have the same amount of time. You got like, you know, a day maybe to get a character done. So you get the drawing and pose, and it's done in like 20 minutes. Okay, well now you have seven hours and 40 minutes to work on juice. We'll talk about juices in a minute. But to juice it. Juice it. Okay. So that's Daz model, and you can see kind of how powerful that is. What else we got here? 3D perspective. Again, using 3D to get our perspective right is something we also always do, especially for anything with architecture. So again, where the 3D comes in, we had this painting that you saw on the website there. Um, this is an impossible thing to, you know, stuff, space stuff especially, you definitely need 3D for. And that was our initial 3D block out for that. Um, and I'll reference this a couple times, because how we use 3D for this painting is how we use 3D for like a, quite a bit of stuff. Um, what else we got here? Put one of those copies of that up here. So that's 3D for perspective. Now you kind of don't have perspective to worry about anymore, right? Your through perspective is all sorted in 3D. Now, is it not important to have perspective knowledge, right, if you're in school or you're learning perspective? Well, yeah, it is, and it's nice, but I don't know why you would use it anymore. I mean, there probably is a use for it, and maybe I know some perspective stuff I'm taking for granted. Like, I'm not aware of how perspective enters into my knowledge of drawing and painting, but, like, man, if you can build a 3D model, now you're not spending time, I mean, certainly, like, learning perspective, three-point and, like, doing all that is a fun exercise, but it's, it's kind of like learning pottery if you're gonna do concept art. That's kind of a bold statement. That's too strong of a statement. I'll take that back. I rescind. Perspective is important. Um, so that's pretty darn handy. What else we got here? 3D lighting. So that covers that. You saw that before. He even did some, 3D, some lights in that 3D scene and this thing that helped to kind of illuminate the scene. And the lights, of course, are part of the composition. You know, you start to see different shapes of stuff. You put the light where you want to silhouette the characters, where you want to lead the eye. And it's not too figured out in the lighting department, of course. It's still pretty, you know, rough mock-up. Um, photo for environment. What that means is finding a photo for an environment. Because, again, one of the ways in which you run up this hill, run up this thing, is if someone gave you an environment painting to work on, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people in school, oh God, so bright. A lot of people in school would probably start with, well, how would you start? Blocking your shapes, right? Hell yeah. Hell yeah, it's blocking them shapes. F key. Yeah, you get the silhouette right, right? You kind of start off by like, oh, this is a little bit too big because my computer is the worst. What's the best laptop, guys? Because I just can't find one. Tell me after. This is brand new. It's a brand new $700 laptop. <laughs> uh, okay, so you block in some shapes. So someone said, okay, we want you to do this fervent mountain Shangri-La, like this Ireland type landscape that's like super fantastical and with incredible rock formations and all kinds of zany stuff. So you might, you might get in there and start like messing around with some shapes. You know, you, you paint them in like you do. You know, you erase them out like you do, and you start, you start kind of developing some stuff, and you might, you might have a, um, what's his name? Stick salesman. 
You guys seen that site? The Adventures of Stick Salesman? It's all a bunch of concept art that has this guy holding a stick in it. <laughs> From all over, just random concept art. So look it up, Adventures of Stick Salesman. It's really good. Okay, so, you know, you come up with, like, an awesome rough thing, right? Which, is, which could be cool. It's a great way to start, you know, and it's a great way to kind of get a rough idea. But let's say you started fleshing it out from here kind of to that level. And again, depending on how much mileage you had, you'd do this better. Like, if you had drawn thousands of mountains, lots and lots of rocks, you would have more of a sense of how they could be formed, right? But if you hadn't drawn a lot of rocks, you'd do classic... Um, you do classic, uh, let me do a concept art, more concept art tropes. You'd have rocks going this way, and then you'd have rocks going this way. I'm like, that's not geologically feasible. <laughs> rocks grow a certain way. You can't just have rocks going all different ways. The sediment layers on, right? The sediment layers on, and then it lifts the rock up. How dare you? <laughs> um, so we had a lot of conversations about what's geologically reasonable. <laughs> In our, at our company. So you'd have rocks going different ways. So if you had left it at that, you would kind of be limited at a certain point. Because especially when you got into starting to texture it and add all the little bits and pieces, you would kind of, and especially what your knowledge of geology is. And I know that's a weird thing to think about when you're a concept artist drawing rocks, but like, if you want the rocks to feel far away, like they're the right scale, ah, oh, so much cool NDA stuff I can't show you. Damn it. But if you wanted to draw rocks that were the right scale, you would need something, and you had sent me like something that was loose like that. So let's say you fleshed that out and it was a little more painterly. And I looked up online and I found, I don't know, I looked up this place, the Faroe Islands. I'd be like, you're fired. What do I need you for? You joking? Like, look at that. How hard would this be to like change a few shapes on? So maybe you started with that, but then maybe you went in later or you had this as an inspiration. And you could do it a lot of different ways. You know, you could start with the sketch, and then you could simplify that out a little bit to kind of match it. Or you could go vice versa. Do you know what I mean? But if you have the incredible things that exist in the world, like this, this is called Tindholmer, and it's in the Faroe Islands, which is a random island chain. I mean, what the hell are you talking about, nature? <laughs> and it's so, much more, it's, it's so much more beautiful and nuanced then that initial thing, like that's cool, but we've seen that, right? We've seen that. And again, we're working with the couple of top studios and there's 200 people. So how are you gonna get them? How are you gonna get them? You're gonna go in there like a crazy person and have an actual passion for the fact that this goes down like that. You're like, oh, that's cool. If you've ever looked at something so minuscule and stupid, like the fact that this drops off, and gone like, oh, that's, that's kind of cool how it does that. Then you're a, a crazy person, right? And that's how you know you've reached, you're getting up, you have your sights on those top 200 people because they're all insane, right? They, they, they have a love for the fucking, I love it. Like, I love that. Everyone has a different thing. I don't care about tech stuff. But one of my guys, when he looks at stuff, who did this thing, he designed these panels like five or six times on here on the side, this computer panel with different types of layouts, and he had touch screens, and he had nodules, and he keeps changing them, and he's like, I don't like those. They look like shit. I'm like, they don't look like shit. They look fine. He's like, they look like shit. And I was like, okay, you're teaching me stuff because I don't love panels. I love rock things. So everyone has their own like, thing that they care about. Now, he's taught me... He's trained me. He's pulled me up that mountain, right? Because we're both here, and he's been up here, and he's be like, no, this way, dumbass. And I'm like, no, I like it in the tent. It's warm in here. But he's telling me, like, no, this is the way we're going with tech stuff, and he teaches me. Um, and part of the reason is because he loves it and has an outstanding eye for tech. You know, he did this. Um, and I love storytelling and people. And he's very kind of methodical and just all about the tech. So I said, you know, we had this guy posed in a lot of different kinds of, just like in a generic background. And I was like, what if, it was during the World Cup, I'm like, what if he's got a kid's soccer ball? 
and there's like a little African kid and he wants a soccer ball back. And the robot's like nee, 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 scanning ball. I thought, ah, oh, that'll be like a fun story. So we collaborated, collaborated and then I said stuff and then he did all the work, but like that's a collaboration. I'm an art director, so. Uh, but uh, he's got a real passion for how parts and pieces come together. You know, like how that trim looks, how these canisters are, how the weathering is, what these latches actually do, how the hinges would actually work. And he'll spend time designing these individual pieces. Now, the only reason he can uh, design to that level of detail and keep messing around with it is, again, because, of course, he builds it in 3D. And he goes back and forth, and he does lots of iterations in 3D. Um, and if we're going to go back to our part, our slide here, some of the things he used here, what's another one? Kit bashing, A7. Does anyone know what kit bashing is? Yeah? OK, kit bashing is the most egregious of cheating trickery. You find someone who has a lot of awesome parts, and a lot of people sell their parts online, um, and great 3D modelers who know how to build really beautiful, complex things. And then you can use them for whatever you want, right? Like this could have been like the inside of some case, but this is some serious, like skillful modeling. But this guy did not model this. He didn't model any of these details. He just found pieces from this kit, and then we just bash them together. It's like sketching, but now you're sketching in 3D. And you still have to have an artistic eye, right? Because you might have to concentrate detail only here and give us some rest here. Like there's a lot of people, uh, concept artists nowadays, who uh, build everything in 3D. They, you know, really high-end concept artists for like the top movies. And they just put shit everywhere. But this guy, I like him because he's got, he's still reserved, you know? He left an area that didn't have detail on detail on detail. Again, I like Oblivion. So he's in line with me, we're cool, thumbs up, we're onward. So he built that, textured it after that, real carefully. Again, that's not fun. It's fun for him. It's not fun for a normal sane person who likes to draw. He likes drawing. I gotta go in here and find the right text for this hinge. You know what I mean? It's like crazy. But he loves doing that sort of thing, and so that's kind of where his career ends up heading towards. Photo sh character, we covered that. That's photo characters, finding a picture of a character. Photo shoot, this one's kind of fun. We've got a lot to say about this one. So I'll start with this, our guy Lake here. After he built the 3D, after he built the 3D, we had a conversation, and he was like, how do I, do you think I should move forward with this? Should I build more 3D? And I said, here's what you could do. How much are we billing for this? Like, how much time are we spending on this painting? We spent forever on this painting, like two weeks. I was like, go to the store. Just go to the leather store and just go buy shit. And he said, well, how much can I spend? I was like, I don't know, 100 bucks? I don't know. Like, how much money we spend making a game? Like $150 million? Yeah, spend 100 bucks at the store and save yourself some time. Go buy some shit. But you got to have balls to be this guy. You, gotta have to, you have to really not give a shit. You have to be like, I'm buying the boots. I'm doing everything. I'm dressing up. I'm wrapping it, and I'm getting in character. And he did a lot of poses, right? He didn't just get this down in one shot. And he even took care to match the lighting. He put a light on the floor moving up. This one's really cool, because he's using his iPhone light as a fireball. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's insane. This, you're competing with this guy? He's a crazy person. How are you going to? And that's how all my guys are. They're all like that, because once they all kind of start talking to each other, they're like, oh, I guess it's not crazy to do that. I guess that's totally normal. Don't tell them that they're crazy. Um, another guy that did something similar was on this piece. We had this painting that we did for the military, for the actual military, which was cool, actually. They had this guy, Captain Long, who uh, this division was being retired. And you know they do commemorative paintings in the military, but now they wanted to give it like a contemporary spin. So they hired us to say, we got this guy, and I read his story. This guy's story was crazy. So it was Vietnam. He's fighting off you know, the enemy, and they start kind of ambushing them in these A cabs. And he starts like shooting. He runs into the bushes, but then he runs out, and he starts grabbing guys and pulling them to safety, grabbing them, wounded guys, one at a time, one at a time. 
And then he went up into the top of one of those things, and someone had thrown a grenade into it, and he had like three guys around him, and then he just smothered a grenade and blew himself up. Yeah, that kind of guy. So I was like, oh yeah, we're doing this job, for sure. So that's him, and uh, it was the most badass thing I've ever heard. They're doing like a big old commemorative you know, ceremony for him, and they're retiring this division. This is a really fun image to work on, but it was a lot of back and forth and a lot of like pitfalls. But again, after Lake had done that other piece, this guy's like, oh yeah, dude, I'll take pictures. Screw it. <laughs> doing it. Bam. You know? So it kind of started a trend of like, oh, I guess crazy is not so crazy. Uh, movie stills. That was something Rob touched on too, which I think was really good. Uh, in that stills from movies, and this is, again, a lot of these things, I'm just saying them, but I don't even do them that much. Movie stills is like a new thing. That's like, when he said it again in his talk, I was like, we really got to do that more. But we haven't done it enough. And because for movies, you get a really awesome sense of really good, well art direction, good production design. Uh, how many of you guys saw his talk? Rob's? Yeah, he, he had all these uh, cinematographers that I've, I felt so stupid. I was like, I should know all these people with weird French names. Um, but there's, in terms of class, right, if, I, if that's the style that you're into and you're, you're on board with what I, you know, the, the style that I said I liked then these, this kind of movie would be an amazing movie to kind of look at for everything. You know, and looking at something like this. When I was telling you, Justin, for example, he had this thing where he uh, cared about those monitors, right? And he was like, really cared about them, and I care about rocks. You're like, well, how do I, I don't care. Like, how do I develop an understanding of what's good design? Because that's such an ambiguous thing. Um, it's over here in this section right here, design. How do I get like a good sense of it? I would say, just look at your favorite thing and copy that for the first six months that you do that thing. And it's gonna look awesome. And then you'll start to develop your own thing. And anyway, it's gonna be your own thing anyway because you won't be able to copy it exactly. But you might look at this if you were designing a space outfit and look at his holster, look at how it's connected, look how it's weathered, look at the kind of gun, the design of the gun how it's put together. These are the best people in the world, and these movies come out all the time. And how many of you have walked through them and screen grabbed? I'm talking to myself, because I haven't done that enough either. <laughs> but it's messed up, because you got all this amazing design information every time a blockbuster film comes out that you can just get yourself going. Again, that's only if you are interested in going up really fast, you know? That's, the copying thing is only for people who just want to go straight up. Because again, you saw the movie did it, and the movie's up here, so you're like, I'm going that way. But if you want to explore, enjoy. You know, hang glide off this cliff. Woo! Do whatever you want. But if you want to move straight up, just copy people who did it really well. Um, shape juice. This is one of the biggest, I think, things in terms of me trying to figure out who I can possibly hire you know, to do this kind of work, is that they have an awesome sense of shape design. And for that, I'm going back to the best. The best. And it's uh, my boy Eitan, one of the best concept artists I've ever seen. And really, it's because he knows how to simplify stuff. Really simplify stuff. He'll find a photo, like you can see, he found some photos, but then he'll like blend mode over them, or he'll find a photo and he'll simplify the overall shape. Like maybe he started with the shape, like you saw, then he put the photos in, that added a believableness, and then he blended them out with like a mixer brush tool or with some overpainting, just enough so they don't look like photos anymore, right? That's the goal. It's to find that exact line, and it's a very subtle and nuanced line. He also has stuff like this, and he's master of this uh, thing he likes to call a slice of light. That's his thing. He loves slices of light. So that's shape juice. Now, depending on the job you're working on, we have a lot of jobs where maybe we can do that, have them be more sexy. We try sometimes to have it be simple and clean and sexy. But uh, it depends. When Aton is doing his own personal pieces, he can do whatever he wants with the shapes, right? Because his shapes are dictating the composition. He's literally making shapes. And then whatever that shape is, OK, well, that's the tower, right? In pro concept art, and he, of course, is a pro too, but in concept art where you have like a bunch of technical things or a bunch of requirements, you can kind of do it, but you can't do it as cleanly and simply as he can just because he's got absolutely no restraints. 
But you can try, like we started with this piece, and you can see that process beginning to end here, right? Just messing with shapes. And you can see, this is for, uh, you guys know Cliffy B, game developer? He started a studio called Boss Key, worked at Epic, made Gears of War. Anyway, he started a new studio, and about two years ago, we did kind of all the initial concept art to get his pitch off the ground, to like pitch it to get his money to start a studio, which was really f awesome and really fun. But he had, this, uh, he had this really cool idea of these, I can't say anything. So anyway, uh, but he had these things that were floating, and we had to sort of figure out how we were going to make it sexy at first with the shapes, and then try to match it and build the entire thing in 3D just so that we had perfect perspective going into the background. And if you look at the final, I have to say, that little bit of extra craziness with like building a whole 3D model based on a sketch that's inherently done, right? We could have just taken the sketch and just started to photo bash on top of it. Maybe we didn't need the model. But the model gave us these awesome scale cues. And so now this picture, you feel like you're like, you're really moving through it because you understand the scale really clearly and you know like, well, that tree's really far so it has to have a much smaller texture than the tree that's closer up. So that's shape. That's a really difficult one to explain because it's more of a feel. Color juice, I'll skip that one. It's a little difficult to talk about. Uh, simplification and detail control. These are the highest level of sort of subtle sensibility that you can have for a concept, is the detail control. And I was trying to think of a sexier name for it, but really it's just detail control. And let me show you exactly what I mean. That Captain Long image, okay, we had this kind of ambient version of it done. And by ambient, meaning there was no direct sunlight, except for on this back tree, but I told the artist to paint it kind of in ambient light so that we could make sure it was thumbs up in the ambient light, and then later we'll add the sunlight on a separate layer. But you can see those trees in the background. And this painting, or let's say, I need another one here. This one, this was his kind of final one that he delivered. Right before, like we kind of worked on it a little bit, me and him back and forth, and I touched it up a little bit. But this is the final one he delivered, and there's a lack of detail control, and this is such a nuanced and subtle thing. But it, like, it's that next level. It's like between like the really good and like the superstars, is that they just have a sense of it. And what that all that means is when you see something that has too much detail, like this tree that isn't the focal point, they push it back just a little bit. And there's all these techniques for doing it. One, the median filter in Photoshop. Maybe paint daubs, maybe like Acvis artwork, which is this filter that like adds paint strokes to anything. But I'll show you, remember what that looked like. Let me see if I can pull up the next one. You see what happened to those trees in the background? Compared to this? Now you're like, well, that's such a nuanced, subtle thing. But you notice how those edges in the background are just softer and they're less texture density, meaning there's a couple filters on, them, on top of them and they're seasoned. It's like seasoning a, a stew just perfectly. And you season every little thing and then you get something that when you look at it in the end, you're like, well, obviously, that's how it always should have been, duh. But it was perfectly seasoned. That's something that very, very few concept artists, I think, have an eye for and something that's really hard to teach and something that we're like, I'm hammering on them constantly for that kind of thing. But it makes a big, big old difference. Uh, composition, that's in the sexiness shape juice. I think that fits under here. Composition, we put it in three categories because it applies in a lot of these different ways. Uh, Storytellinginess. Do you know the, the story point of the picture you are concepting? Did you even decide what you're trying to say? And are your visual decisions designed to help say it? Now, I'm annoyed. I, when I hear that, it just annoys me because it sounds like artistic bullshit. But here's what I mean. Is there even a narrative in your picture? I see so many pieces of art, too, that there's no narrative to it. And a lot of times with concept art, there is no directive to have a narrative, right? Your, your art director may not even require it. 
and our art directors might not. They might say, just give us a picture. We need a landscape shot of this thing. We don't necessarily need a story to be told. Um, but when we delivered this to Cliffy, he didn't tell us about this narrative that was supposed to be like a, a couple guys from the future. You know they're from the future because they have blue light things. And they're sitting around a fire, and obviously they're well-dressed, they're not homeless, so you know they're like sort of, well, not, not completely vagrants. There's some sort of faction, you can kind of tell. And one of them starts noticing this thing, but the other two haven't noticed it yet. Do you know what I mean? There's like a lot of stuff going on, and it's just one moment. Why not? You know, throw it in there. But it has to be simple, and it has to be clear. You see a lot of concepts, too, with like, maybe this is going on, right? This relationship between what's happening and what's happening. And also there's helicopters shooting at each other. And you're like, oh, one thing can ruin it. The narrative has to be super simple, super clear. Again, if you saw Rob's talk, you'll know like it was just, the storytelling has to be so simple and so clear. And in a lot of those shots, in a movie you have more of an advantage, right? Because in a movie you can have multiple shots. We're stuck. So we already have to jam too much into the, into the picture. Already, because it's just concept. We only have one frame to tell the story. In a movie, you can cut between them. Design, taste, composition. We talked a little bit about all those things. And we talked about taste a little bit, but here's a slide that I helped to kind of underline it. Again, when I'm working on something, let's say an environment piece, I want it to have an epic vista. I want it to have a clear line of action. These are all the things that maybe I had wanted. The things that were grayed out was the things that the client may have wanted. They wanted like a sunny, crisp day in the Himalayas. The reason this is important is because, and actually this is a big one. Let me open one more thing here. Okay, there is the pasture, which is this fantasy world that uh, you're allowed to explore in, right? So a lot of times if you're starting a new IP or something, or you're doing your own project, you kind of have free reign to kind of do whatever you want. Or you might have an art director that says, just, I want you to just explore. Do you know what I mean? I don't want you to like put any restraints on it. Right now, sort of anything goes. And although, depending on the IP, that could be good, if you have all the time and all the budget in the world. But our studio, this never works for us because we're not like soldiers. We're like Navy SEALs. We're called in for a specific job to kill a certain person, and we come down, and we kill them, and then we leave, and then we shed a single tear. And that's all we do. So for people who are in a studio setting, you're learning the art direction style. You have a lot of time to figure it out. But we couldn't work for any of those studios. You can't have a Crytek call you and be like, we need you to do this thing in three days on a brand new IP Whatever we deliver the first pass, they're either firing us or they're keeping us, right? We're not going to have a ton of time to explore. So what I try to do with my guys and with every client is determine what this corral is. What is it exactly? Like, here's the shape of everything that is possible, and then here's the corral that we're allowed to play in. And that corral could be any bit of art direction. And that last one, it was sunny, and it was Himalayas. That's all they said, right? So a lot of people, you have two kinds of artists. You have, you have a kind of artist in hiring, I've noticed this. A kind of artist that says, fuck this corral, I do what I want, I do what I want. <laughs> and that's fair, I respect that. But you can't work for very long if you have that attitude. And then you have uh, another kind of artist that just cowers here in the corners, like just tell me, just tell me, please, please tell me what you want me to draw. And that's just, Fucking maddening. That's when I lose my shit, too. Because this person has died inside, and this person is lawless. <laughs> so where is the perfect balance? And there just there is a perfect balance. And that is like a Navy SEAL. You literally, nothing can phase you, but you're indestructible. And I want someone to have as much fun as they can in this space. And that's kind of how I naturally ended up, because I'm, I like design. So I like when you say x plus y equals, and then I go, oh, z, here's a great solution to your problem that I think is a visual solution to all the things. You gave me all these parameters, and I feel like we solved it beautifully. How do you like that? I get a lot of pleasure from that. Um, but I say, 
and this speaks to anyone who's struggling or starting out in concept art, is no matter how small the job or whatever the parameters are that are given to you, have a ton of fun in that space. Do your best in this space, because every job is going to be like this. It never gets better. It's all going to be like this. You're always going to have a corral. And it's fun to like, have an obstacle course to see what you can do and run around in, instead of just running free. I get scared if you tell me to run anywhere and do anything. I'm like, well, how do I know if I've solved it? It's like you got rid of this, and you'd be like, come up with solutions. I'm like, D. <laughs> OK, <laughs> I don't know. Does that work? I think there's a lot of games and art direction styles that, that, that are this way, too. They just kind of like, do whatever you want and whatever cool shit you come up with. Because the problem with this, and this goes all the way back to my taste. I like Oblivion, right? And I like that aesthetic. Is that I want all the visual things to come from story things. Now, in games, they don't always. You know? They sometimes do, they sometimes don't. But a lot of times, they don't. At least they don't rigorously. But I kind of want that. So when I see stuff that looks like it had no restraints on it, right? A design that I can just tell. He's got like 45 wings and like eagle eyes and tentacles. And like, when I, when I see that, I'm like, this person, even if they rendered it well, they never had a design problem to solve. They're not a designer. And you look, you, you see whole portfolios full of stuff like that. You say 10 minutes to me? OK, cool. Uh, and uh, that's the difference between a designer and a concept artist. So I'd say, oh, and one more thing about this corral. My job sometimes with the client is to help build the corral. So here's another kind of client you might get. When you, we've all had these kinds before, and I've been on both sides of it. They're like, this is the corral that we know about. And you're like, OK, well, is he mean? And they're like, yes. You're like, cool. <laughs> is he smart? Yes. Is he badass? Of course. So you help to build with them. So if you have a corral, for example, an art director gives you a brief that's kind of maybe you don't know fully what it is, it's good to ask questions. It's hard, because it's your boss. you know. And sometimes they might get annoyed. They'll be like, I don't know what it is. I don't know. And you're like, you don't have to know. I'm just trying to find out as much as I can. And whatever you don't tell me, I'll make it up. OK, so maybe this isn't decided. OK, well, then I decided. Your job is to solve as much as you can. So even if they don't know the parameters, you help them come up with the parameters. Because you have a, you have a passion for it. You, you heard what the initial idea was, and you have things you want to add to it. Last thing, I just wanted to show some sketches for that robot thing, because they're just cool. Look at that. It comes up like a rooster. I just thought it was so bad. It was badass because it's not badass. It's almost more scary like that this thing would shoot lasers at you and kill you. Because it's not trying to be tough. It's designed just to murder. You can tell. Because no one who was trying to make it cool would design it to look that stupid. So it's more scary to me. Okie doke. All right, well, I'll stop there and uh, give some time for questions. Thank you, guys. By the way, awesome, fantastic, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, about that corral you were saying? Yeah. You, you said, oh man, yeah, this guy, is, is he awesome? Yeah, is he badass? OK, is he nice? He's nice, but what if the client goes, yeah, he's nice, and he's mean? <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's both at the same <laughs> or, time? Or, or, or he's a family man, and yet he's not. <laughs> yeah, you do get a lot of those. And if they don't give you enough direction, they're going to come up with, they're going to get a generic design. Because you know? we totally had uh, a character where we had to concept for a character. And like, I swear, they were all over the place. <laughs> like you had to. I think that's the <laughs> hardest thing to do anything cool. Then, you know what? Your only metric short of a story is cool and awesome. So, so, uh, so many things in games are cool and awesome in lieu of a story. The only way you can make it unique, like in Oblivion, the guy had a New York Yankees hat, right? And it looked cool. But can you imagine doing a video game character with a New York Yankees hat? People would be like, that was a future space ma marine? Yeah, You'd be like, like what the hell are you even talking about? That's in, you're a crazy <laughs> person. The artist needed the story to come up with that unique visual thing. So if they don't give you a story, then they're going to get something badass. So I would fall back on badass. As a default, and then if they allow you to go better than badass and more better than cool and awesome, then cool. Yeah, then you it have was a good, a good experience. Um, we basically got to do whatever we wanted, though, basically. But I was more going to ask you if you had an experience with a client 
in any of your paintings that had that and where, how that went for you? All the time, yeah, and then we just default to badass. Yeah, okay. And badass. I get bummed out. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> bummed out, I'm sorry, it's gonna look good, but it just won't be unique. Hi. Uh, can I just say really quick that I'm really glad that this lecture went the way that it did, considering the title, because I'm an art student graduate who just graduated a few months ago. This is my first time at GDC. Oh, nice. And sort of show up here and to see that Shadi Safadi is hosting a lecture called Concept Art is Dead. Oh, no. What I happened? I know. I was just being Where did it go? Okay, I was bummed you. out they called, and then you thank dropped that bomb no, on the title. I spent the past you. four hours since I got here at noon just like having a, on the verge of a heart attack. Like, oh, my God. Do I have to be a telemarketer now? <laughs> Anyways, um... You mentioned at the beginning of your lecture there was a gentleman who uh, his art improved drastically over the guidance of your studio. John Sweeney, yeah. Yeah. Do you know how another young aspiring concept artist might find the same sort of mentorship? Yeah. He had Aton, so you had to make friends with the right people. Okay. Fantastic. No, I mean, honestly, like if you have a team of people, Aton started in school. He got picked by Rob, who did a talk earlier, out yeah. of school because he was talented, super talented. So his portfolio was awesome. But in, in Otis, where he went to school, he had a team of like four other guys and they would all, forget the teachers, they would all work with each other and they would one up each other, one up each other. Nice. And they all had a really positive attitude. Like, I don't know about you, but when I was in school, I did not have a good attitude. Like every other artist was a threat to me. <laughs> so I was, I was just a bad person. So yeah. it wasn't until I, until I decided like, no, I'm gonna be inspired by other people's work instead of hate it. Now you can hate it, you can go through the cycles, right? It's cycle. You look at it, you're like, wow, and you're like, damn it, and then you're like, fuck you, and then you're like, no. <laughs> it's like this thing. But as long as you end up at, what can I learn from this person, then you've traveled the full path. Right, okay. Uh, so but find a team of friends, yeah. Or online, I've, I've seen a lot of people on Facebook. I've hired half my company from Facebook. So I see their art, and I'm like, that's really good. Do you wanna try this job out? I give them a test job to try out. No art test, no nothing, just, just do this job, because now we're both invested. Try it out and see if you can get there. And I've had people that have sent me stuff over the course of two years on Facebook, and then finally they just get good enough. And really? I, start, I start giving them jobs. Fantastic, okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. That's it? Cool. Go ahead. You have to go to the mic, they told me to tell you. They only give me one rule, they have to go to the mic. Yeah, that's cool. So far. <laughs> um, what led you to concept art more than art in general? Like, art can be something that gives more expression in if it's more cartoonish or more, I'm not sure to explain myself, but you, you're going for really realistic things, and what pushed you to that more than something else? Oh, like if you're saying, uh, you're asking if it wasn't so realistic, if you're doing a style that wasn't as realistic. Yeah. Well, actually, I never got to it, but I wanted to show this. This was a uh, much more stylized thing that we worked on. And it was for Spark, and they gave us the sketch. And after we had the sketch, and we were supposed to kind of flesh it out, they gave us this very cartoony sketch. Even after we had the sketch already done, we still built it in 3D and then rendered it after we built the 3D. So the, t the technical stuff, I think, still comes into play no matter what. And we have, like, for example, a, a more realistic, let's say, stylized section on our website. And I'm, I'm actually trying to get our studio more into stylized work. But we're known for realistic stuff. But we have more stylized stuff. And for that, maybe not all the techniques apply. Like, maybe this one wasn't done in 3D. This one was, like, hand-drawn and then filled in, like, you know, each color was filled in as a flat color, and then it was slowly rendered and shaded by hand. It was kind of a little more traditional. Um, but what's crazy is this more artistic stuff that takes more art skill is way harder, I think, way harder. Yeah. And part of the reason that I think our companies move towards realistic is because it's easier to cheat. For this, you need real drawing skill. And real drawing skill that you must have for this is more rare than it is someone who can train to, like, Kit bash something together. Now everything has its place, but I think if you really like hand drawing and you really like cartoony stuff, for the drawing and design part, everything traditional is perfect. Then for the rendering part, maybe sometimes 3D, the shape design stuff like here in the environment still apply, exactly the same. Uh, color stuff, theory still applies. This started from a photo. You can see right here if you click on there, it started from a photo. So I didn't even make this up. And you can see some of the steps from like photo, to kind of more cell shaded, but going off the photo. 
and then rendering it out a little bit more one step at a time. Because for characters, you, you talk about taking photos of actual people to have like exact poses that gives better expressions. But you, you know, most of the time, like for example, I'm just trying to say if you have someone who, if they said design an animated feature character, that wouldn't work. So part of the challenge is like, for me and for my guys, is being like, of this card deck of, of awesome tricks, which one can I use now? Maybe none of them. If you use the wrong one, it won't work at all. You're saying for like a cartoony animated feature, it's annoying because you can't use any of them because all you need is drawing ability. Like none of these things really apply, right? And that's really, that's why it's, I, 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 we have one artist that's like amazing at animated style stuff, but she's really rare. Um, so yeah, I would say if you like drawing and designing cartoony characters, keep doing that. Once you start getting into the rendering of them, then you might use some cheats. So what kind of advice would you give for more cartoonish style? Like to improve like that person you showed? Who improved in like three months really well? Oh, like how to improve in your cartoony drawing style? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because that's a, that's really tough, and actually, I don't know enough about how to do it well myself to even. But I did take a class with a guy named David Coleman. David Coleman. He's an animator at uh, Paramount, and I took a class at the Concept Design Academy here in LA. Mm -hmm. No, we're in San Francisco. <laughs> in LA. Concept Design Academy has outstanding classes. And, and, and he taught me everything that I currently know. I hadn't been in school, obviously, in a long time. But I did a lot of these characters, these cartoony things, in his class. Because he taught me a lot of things about shape design and stuff. OK, well, thank you. Sure. He's got uh, online, he's got DVDs. Look him up, David Coleman. Hi. Uh, well, uh, I should say, to start off, to contextualize this a little bit, I'm a producer, and I'm regularly told I've got the artistic acumen of a blancmange, so cool. um, I'm more than aware of I'm coming at it from a different angle to everybody else in the room, and yeah, I'm sorry that you all have to listen to me. Um, <laughs> I worked, when I worked with Wizards of the Coast on the Magic the Gathering stuff, I worked with some really supremely uh, talented uh, concept dudes, and also they had their own uh, concept people. But one of the problems that I had was my internal guys, uh, a couple of them specifically, and these were the kind of guys, they had personalities, they, they knew their, their shit, they would go skydiving and deep sea diving and water rafting and oh, cool. snort coke off cisterns and whatever else. But as soon as you put them in the room with the client and you ask them to take some notes, they would start chewing their bottom lip, uh, switch off, and I end up as the producer, somebody who doesn't understand art, particularly to that, that technical level, trying to be a, a bridge between these two people. And my question is, do you have anybody on your team who has those kind of communication issues where they switch off? And, and what tools do you use to get the client to communicate with them? Well, in our case, none of them have to communicate with the client. Everything goes through me. So my guys never talk to the client. But I do have guys that, um, I have the opposite thing. I have, I, have a lot of, I have a handful of guys that are really quiet, you know, that have a really hard time opening up. And so I try, are your artists that the skydiving, base jumping, Superman artists, are they, are they good? Yeah, well, I'm told their stuff's good. When, their stuff's good? Yeah. I don't yeah. think they trust that, but yeah. That's, that's awesome, then, as, as long as they're really good. Yeah, like I have, I always thought myself, because I have, a, you know, kind of I'm a loud personality, I always thought you had to kind of be a loud personality to be good at art, because that's part of how you see the world. Not true at all. I have guys that have more passion about every tiny little thing in art who speak so softly and barely utter a word when you say anything to them. And I just decided, okay, part of the value of managing a team of people is that I constantly adapt my personality to their personality. So if they're slow, when I call them on the phone to ask them what the thing is, I just hold it up and I go, hey, dude, how's that piece coming? And this is what they say. Good. <laughs> and, I, and I take a deep breath. I sit in a chair when, before I call them, and I know, OK, this is going to go a lot slower than the way I speak. And I kind of cater myself to them. Because I think that's valuable. And because for them, I, I, that's kind of part of the personality of the job. And from watching House of Cards, I learned a lot, right? <laughs> you learn a lot from that show, but I do with people. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, guys, I, I brought a ton of business cards. If you want to get in touch with me for anything, there's just a stack of them. Take whatever you want, because I brought them just to be taken. And I'll hang out 
for whatever. I'll talk to everybody for a few minutes, like when, if, if we're gonna talk after, for a few minutes and then go on to the next person because I know how it is when you're waiting to talk to someone for like 40 minutes and they're talking to one person forever. You know what I'm saying? So I'll try to keep it quick. So I'm not interrupting you. I'll just talk and then we'll just keep moving. And if you want to stick around, we'll keep talking. Got it? Thanks, guys.